<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of You Can't Handle the Truth! The show that's clearly inspired by The Needle Drop, one of my favorite YouTubers over there. So go ahead and check out Anthony Fantano if you have any inkling to uh, see some badass great music reviews. And in today's episode, we're going to be taking some of your hot spicy takes and I'll be responding to them in a very one-sided debate format where I make my opinions clear in response to your opinions and then the comment section kind of figures out who had the better points once the video is posted. It's actually like a nice formula I've accidentally come across. I didn't think that would be the case but like my audience acts as a judge, jury, and executioner. That's right. Whoever loses dies. That's why I have so many extra Daniels. I just, I just offer them up. And this video is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is the online learning community that you've already heard about from tons of content creators you trust. There's a reason so many of us let Skillshare sponsor us. It's because they're one of the few products we can swear by as content creators. It's an online learning community with countless of topics to choose from, from qualified professionals. I just checked out Daniela Kreis's creative breakthroughs, and it was really awesome information on how to get your brain going. For less than the cost of most of those streaming services, you're spending way too much time on a month if you use the yearly subscription plan. That's right, less than $10 a month. You can have access to all this potential brain power right there at your fingertips. So use that link right there down in that description for the first thousand of you to go ahead and click it. You will get two months of Skillshare for free. That's right, it's free. Go ahead and check it out. Explore it if you want it. Back to the video. I feel that we should get the perspectives of religious people in fantasy. There are often religious people in fantasy, but usually not any of the perspectives who are often indifferent or dismissive of religion. I think that is just a not to get political, a reflection of the times we're in a bit where we are seeing a de-religiousification, which that's a word, of America currently where, you know, religious rates are on the decline. I'm not trying to say anything about that. It's just an objective truth that they're on the decline. And I think this is reflective of a more anti-organized religion mentality we are seeing. Again, I'm not trying to get political on you. I'm just pointing out something that is occurring currently in the nation. And as is with our fiction, it often reflects real life. And so we're seeing, you know, a more critical view of the role religion has played in history uh, come to prevalence within our uh, texts. Now, what I will push back against this on is we do often see religious figures just not in the typical Western sense of what you'd think of a religious figure like a priest. But I could easily make the case that an Aes Sedai within the Wheel of Time is the equivalent of a priest in our world, or that Gandalf is a Jesus figure. And so we have religious figures in the sense of not your typical Western view of religion where someone who's out there preaching trying to convert, but in the sense of a believer who is a part of a religion. In the Wheel of Time, there is a religion the Aes Sedai follow. It's just, it's not really debated or talked about because it's considered a universal truth of that world that there's a creator, there's a dark one. So what's there to really talk about with it? You don't have the converters uh, that we often see or even the preacher uh, type scenario going on. It's funny, the more I thought about this one, the more I realized that those who are involved with the religion can be painted in a very neutral tone. Let's continue with the Aes Sedai example or those who are seen as like aggressors for the religion, continuing with the Wheel of Time example, white cloaks are painted in a negative light. So what I'm seeing from my experience, and this is true for more series, multiple examples, uh, people involved with religion aren't necessarily bad. Uh, religious institutions can be fine, but they are often flawed. And those flaws are clear reflections of issues we've seen in our own world. And then we have the people who are more aggressive, more out there, more violent about it are painted in a very negative light. Uh, I've seen this in everything from Forgotten Realms, A Song of Ice and Fire, like many fantasy series seem to be embracing this more uh, hypercritical and reflecting our own world approach to how we've seen religious institutions behave. But really interesting point. I like this one. It's probably one of my favorite kickoffs to a less debate I've had. I hope the comments remain respectful because this is a sensitive topic, but it's one I would really like to see people's responses to because that is, that is a, that is a good hot take. 
Well done. Hot take. Though I admit Stephen King is a fantastic author, if he was just starting out as an author today and tried publishing his earlier classics, he'd get rejected by most, if not all, of the big publishers. His writing has too many flaws that modern editors wouldn't have the patience for. Modern authors just have a better grasp on plotting and pacing than early King does. That's why some of his works are 1,000 page tomes where they could be 500 page page turners. So this is actually interesting. I just made a post on Twitter Tuesday about how I'm really tired of the idea of an objective review. Hold up, trust me, this is tied in. And I think what you're saying is true, but it's also, again, a problem I have currently with publications and traditional media uh, because they do have these standards you're talking about where they would reject Stephen freaking King. And I'm completely against that. We even had Evan Winter, author of Rage of Dragons, spin off from my thread and kind of make his own about how he doesn't like that, you know, a publisher or editor will reject you because they consider what you're doing non-traditional pacing or grammar, things like that, when that can be an artistic choice. And the only pushback I got for saying there can't be an objective review were the people who were saying like, oh, well, what about like grammar, spelling, syntax? But if you really think about it, that stuff is still subjective. Uh, a great example to point out would be Nevernight, which made some really interesting choices when it came to presentation of its story that I didn't like, but other people did. It's the kind of thing that someone could be like, well, that's an objectively creative, good decision. No, it's not. Nothing in a review is objective. And Stephen King is a wonderful example of how this is true. So I agree with what what you're saying. And I also think it backs up my point that objective review does not exist. It's actually a weird thing that's been going on in the video game community. We are seeing creators over there push back against the idea of an objective review. There is not one. Every review is about your subjective experience with the material. And if you try to be objective, all you're going to do is give an overview where you're going to be like, oh, it came out this year. The plot was this. That's just an overview. A review is your personal thoughts and experience on the material. So I don't know, that's just been on my mind a lot and this was a really good excuse to talk about that. But I think you're also very right. Could you imagine someone getting like The Shining and being like, no, it's not traditional enough. And then finally, my final take on this is Stephen King, I believe, ironically and strangely enough, would probably be one of these authors who finds tremendous success in self-publishing. I could absolutely see it being something that's put online and then it gets all kinds of internet talk about it and blows up from there. Stephen King is perfect for a self published author mega success currently. Although a couple of his things like Dark Tower, I don't know if Dark Tower would thrive in the self-publishing. That needs a bit of a marketing campaign behind it. I don't know. This is an interesting thought right here. Fantasy religions have a severe underdevelopment problem which feels like an afterthought in their worlds. Writers almost always just go to say a god slash prophet slash the light for a curse and having three religious events if you're lucky instead of having any actual depth. Real world religions have a ton of events that span years and countless people we don't need that depth but a little more would be nice unless it just makes sense within the world like mistborn era one another really good point about religions and fantasy but i actually don't think authors should get too far in depth with their religions like you're talking about why huh what's going on what's dan about to say unless it is a very important part of the narrative. In my experience, it's actually one of the parts of world building that will lose a reader the fastest. Maybe not a lot of fantasy fans, but I know the general audiences out there, if you start going in depth about like a fantasy fictional religion, quite a few people just kind of start rolling their eyes. It's just one of the things of world building where like people enjoy wars, people enjoy histories, people enjoy a lot of that. But if you start going really into mythology, I've just seen a trend where people seem to get tired of it. I don't know why. It's certainly not my case. And I bet people in my audience who are hardcore fantasy nerds wouldn't see this problem. But like go up to your brother or a friend of yours or somebody and see if they would like to read about a religion that's not even real. That's just a part of like some wider thing. A great example of this is like how many people like Lord of the Rings, right? How many of those people then transfer over to liking the Summerillion? It's a very lower percentage of the audience for Tolkien fans, right? Even Yeah, even Tolkien fans don't always make that transition. Now, don't get me wrong, in my audience, there's probably quite a few of those once again, but we have to look at the broader context here and authors, I, I've said this many times before and it still remains true, can't just write 
towards the hardcore fantasy crowd. They need to have some kind of appeal outside of that, not only because they need to make more sales, but I'm also a fan of the fact that it could bring more people into the fantasy circles. One of the reasons A Song of Ice and Fire has reached such success is that it is such minimal anti-fantasy. It's easy to forget when you walk around in the bubble circles that we're in, how many people just aren't interested in fantasy as a whole. Being able to market a book as not hardcore fantasy is quite lucrative right now. That's why you see a lot of these modern fantasy books that have like a different appeal, a different angle will put that to the forefront of their marketing campaigns instead of their fantasy elements. That's just my thoughts on the matter and after looking at like marketing currently what's going on. I'm actually planning to do a whole huge rant review talk about traditional media and publishing and all of this and my observations on it because some of it is just insane. So unfortunately, this whole comment is a bit too long because I don't want to be sitting here just making you guys listen to my dyslexic ass read for five minutes. So I'm just going to go ahead and skip to this last part here, but I'll throw this up bold if people want to read the full comment while I just go through the last bit here. On the morally gray side, what people mean when they say they want a more morally gray character is that I want a person to have killed an innocent person before or betrayed his country and caused mass death. I think you would agree humans alive today are morally gray. I would like to think morally morally lighter gray. How many of them have killed innocent people? Not a lot. Not doing something atrocious doesn't mean the character is not morally gray. Moral grayness can be a character struggling with lying or backbiting. The fact is that most fantasy stories are still quite one-sided. Yeah, the character may have killed someone innocent, but their character is not morally gray. This is why I love redemption arcs. They tend to show this change in their character. Just because Rand had to make some difficult decisions does not mean that his character is any less morally white. It's the fact that he had to ponder these decisions that proves he's still morally white. Not that he had to make a decision. This is why the Tolkien universe is much more morally complex than most stories today, because he examines character morals and how they change rather than physical decisions people make. Oh, this came so close to being a just flat out agree. I really like what you're saying here, that actions do not dictate morality. It's about the internal processes of the character, which is true, for a lot of characters, but many authors enjoy writing some cognitive dissonance or, you know, people can convince themselves that, oh, I'm not necessarily doing evil and this is just a little bit too black and white, haha, <laughs> we're talking about more of the great characters, for me to agree with it. Because from what you're saying, if a character, as long as they are having to think about it, you know, feel bad, remorse, they can still be morally white. People can feel remorse or convince themselves to feel remorse while continuing to do awful stuff. Uh, so I, I think you're on a path of a correct answer, right? Like the, the, the example you put forward is Rand has to do some bad stuff, but because he felt bad about it, it's not necessarily making him a bad person. I disagree if it's repeated a pattern of behavior. I mean, there are all kinds of, uh, you know, loonies out there who have been serial killers who, you know, they talk about how bad they feel, how much they don't want to be doing it, but there's cognitive dissonance in people. And obviously on more muted, smaller scales, we see that in characters all the time. Some of my favorite characters ever, uh, logic and reason their way to doing terrible things. And would you say they are morally white just because they to themselves, what they're doing makes sense? Um, it, you know, so there, there's more dimensions to this debate than just, oh, what's the character internally doing and what are their actions? There's societal factors. I mean, there's the whole field of uh, anthropology, which is going to be about, okay, yes, we view what this person's doing is wrong, but in their culture, it's okay. So who are we to judge their morality based off that? I like where you're going. It's just not quite three-dimensional enough uh, of an argument for me to find it to be the right way to approach it. I do like your example, though, where I did find Tolkien to be a little more nuanced uh, with his morality, but I actually like a lot of modern authors who do take cultural factors uh, more aggressively into play when they look at justification for actions, which is something a lot of classic fantasy never did because that wasn't even really a field of thought as to the forefront of how we approach others as it is now, where we try to go, okay, we don't like what these people are doing, but it's a part of their culture, so who are we to tell them that's wrong? And there's so much discussion that can be had around that, and that does need to come into play uh, with this whole conversation. You know, I, I, some of my favorite characters of all time, I would never want to hang out with. I think they have completely justified what they do in their own head, but that does not mean they are then a good person or what they're doing is okay, even if they're feeling remorse or bad about it. The cyberpunk and steampunk subgenres are severely 
woefully underrepresented, especially when compared to the overabundance of medieval fantasy. I agree, but I also don't understand why when so many people make this point, they specifically just point at cyberpunk and steampunk. There are a bajillion other settings fantasy could be in. Quite literally infinite. Infinite. It's fantasy. Think of it, boom, you could do it. And I get that fans of these two specific subgenres want them more to the forefront, and I agree, I'd like to see them propped up as well, but it's, it's definitely not capturing the full scope of the problem. I'm like borderline, stop writing medieval fantasy. Not really, I love medieval fantasy, get more of it out there, but it's just... There's so much, <laughs> and we have so many more options. Go Renaissance, go Rome, go Ancient Egypt, go, I don't know, 1200s Vietnam. I don't know what's going on in the 1200s in Vietnam, but write that. That would be neat. I'm just, I love medieval fantasy. It's a, it's my baby, it's great, but kind of just stop a little bit. Like, just tone it down. Don't tone it down. With our current education, almost anyone can write a novel, meaning marketing makes the author. I am sorry, this is so wrong. Hard disagree. The American education system has failed. Uh, to properly make writers out of all of us. So I'm happy to hear that you've met a majority of people who are intelligent and able to write and present thoughts and ideas well, but that has not been my experience. Uh, I agree that marketing can make a series popular. No question. No, not, not most people can be authors. Hell no, absolutely not. I'm sorry, just... Just a big old no! People who support you on Patreon are patrons, not Patreons. <laughs> let's let's keep fighting the pros battle for now. I don't want to start another one. I'm still gonna say pros are. You guys are gonna tell me to say pros is, and that's the that's how we're gonna we're all gonna die. That's how we're all gonna die. You said in your last debate video that mermaids are supposed to be sea monsters. They're not. <laughs> You're thinking of sirens, which are way older of a concept than mermaids, and specifically said to be monstrous fish slash bird creatures with beautiful singing voices that lure sailors into the deep. Mermaids, as seen on Disney movies, are a completely separate concept, and equating the two is fantasy world blasphemy. See, I've seen mermaids all the way back to the OG mermaids be presented as sea monsters that are terrible and murderous, and I've seen them be presented as not. What I should have said there is, and I think I was trying to, but I just presented myself poorly, is that I prefer monstrous mermaids who are gonna murder some people. I don't get the people who are like, I want a sexy mermaid. And I'm like, what are you gonna do? Get in that I don't, I, stop it. This point was actually kind of stemming from a different issue that I wanna put forward as my hot take. And that is that the horror genre is criminally underutilizing currently in today's media. The amazing back catalog of terrifying mythological creatures it could bring forward. We've seen occasionally, you know, um, some old actual real life mythological concept brought forward in horror movies and books, and it usually turns out really well. I, I wanna see that more often. And that's, I. this is my total like rant conspiracy theory here, follow along. That's because a lot of these older mythological creatures were based in like very root real fears back when we were, you know, still living out in nature. And so bringing them up still ages well. It still works. I don't want to see the bye-bye man when I could have someone make a brilliant, terrifying story about, I don't know, a minotaur. That would be awesome. I want to see an actual well-done minotaur horror story. I can already hear the actually people typing that, oh, the bye-bye man was based off of... <laughs> I know but it's the based off of some urban legend with some modern author's twist and it just gets reinterpreted and it just like loses its factor. I like the raw appeal of a lot of these older creations that I think really maintain their horror factor. A Wayne Dango is still scary. Having like a Wi-Fi spooky ghost isn't, isn't scary to me. So that's what I'm getting at. Stop reinterpreting this stuff and adding like lazy, you know, modern twists to it, where like the bye-bye man's gone, it's so scary, cause it's a bye-bye, no. Just go back for like some ancient, I don't know, Japanese mythology. There's tons of really creepy stuff in there and grab some creature that's horrifying. That's just my, that's just my thoughts on the matter. Get something that's primal. Get something that's existed in like the humid subconscious and is a result of our like innate fears of the world. That works better 
to me. I wanted to do a couple more questions, but the battery's running out in the camera. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you wanna support what I do here. Let me know what you think of the new mic. Looks like a little, little mythical creature pee pee by my face. All right. <laughs> like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you wanna support what I do here. And let me know what mythical creature you think would be an outstanding feature for a horror book, TV show, movie, web comic, I don't know, what have you, in the comments down below. And have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my three latest high tier Patreons. Carl Sailor, the only gay in the two rivers. Damn it, I thought I'd be able to get through that without laughing at it. That's a hilarious name. And Erica Waklowski. Hope you guys are having a great one. Peace.